All right, thanks, Kat. Um, yeah, so I'm excited to talk to you today uh, about another um, uh, large open source effort from uh, Databricks, which is MLflow, a new open source project to accelerate the production machine learning lifecycle. Um, so I think everyone who's tried to do machine learning development um, has quickly realized that machine learning development is complex. And the problem is that there are a lot of issues you have to think about and deal with in machine learning that don't happen in a normal uh, traditional software development life cycle. And these issues can easily consume the majority of your effort trying to, to build a production system. Um, so to show some of these issues, I'm just going to go through kind of a basic machine learning life cycle and, uh, and, and highlight some of them. So in the basic life cycle, you know, we've got some data that we begin with. We have to do data preparation. We have to do some kind of model training. And then we have to deploy the model. And then if this application is actually doing anything important, we probably want to monitor it to see how it's doing as well. So that generates more of our data that we have to collect and feed back into this process. Now, what's challenging about this? So I'll, I'll show several of the challenges. So the first challenge is that in machine learning, uh, there are often many different software systems involved. Uh, there are many places you can store data. There are many different uh, data preparation algorithms. You can try many training algorithms, and then many ways that you want to deploy the same model. And uh, unlike in traditional software development, in machine learning, you actually have to support and use all of these. So for example, in normal software, you might pick one database system and one web server that you have to use. But in machine learning, you want to combine data from all the sources you have to get a better model. So you, your system has to be able to interact with all of them. And also, you want to try best-in-class tools continuously to update the model. So you want to try all the latest data preparation algorithms, all the latest machine machine learning framework, uh, all the latest training algorithms, and so on, because your goal is to improve some business metric. You know, let's say you increase the engagement of users uh, with your product by 0.1% or something, that's actually a significant impact on the business. Uh, so you actually have to, to support all these tools. The second challenge is that many of the individual tools also have tuning parameters. And setting these parameters is, is essential to performance. And so as you go through the life cycle, this basically adds another dimension where you have to think about you know, which tuning parameters were used at each stage to get a specific result. And you have to be able to experiment with all of them. Um, third challenge is that all these things have to happen at scale. Machine learning works better, much better, actually, with, with more data. And so you want every step of the process to be able to scale up and, and handle large data volumes. Um, and in addition, you have to think about model exchange. So as you develop the model and pass it between these different tools, for instance, pass it to a server for production, how can you make sure that it's still doing the same thing? You're not rewriting the code, introducing subtle bugs. Uh, and then finally, you know, in any organization uh, doing this for real, you're going to want governance as well. So auditing, being able to prove that your process uh, meets various regulations, uh, or just keeping track of what's happening internally so you can uh, systematically improve the result. So these challenges, as I mentioned, can easily take the majority of the effort in a machine learning project, and you have to really solve them to get to production. So what are people doing about this? Uh, one of the main trends that's happened in, in the industry, especially at large tech companies that basically thrive on data and machine learning, is actually the development of machine learning platforms. So some of the best known ones are from large uh, tech companies. For example, Facebook's FB Learner platform, Uber's Michelangelo, and Google's TFX. And these are internal platforms that accelerate the ML lifecycle. Basically, these platforms standardize the process to do data preparation uh, training and deployment, and they give data scientists an API to use for these, where if they work within the API, uh, the system can automatically manage and deploy the application. And so if you work inside this API, you get, you get all these properties. You, you get to actually productionize it kind of for free. And these platforms have been extremely successful. They power dozens of different machine learning applications at these companies. Many individual features of these apps uh, are maintained using, using these. So they, they definitely accelerate the process. But there are also some limitations to, uh, you know, to these kind of platforms. So the first one is that they're limited to a few algorithms or frameworks. Whatever the engineering team that's building the platform 
platform uh, you know, is, is able to support. And this is always a bottleneck when it comes to data science and machine learning, because the data scientists always want to try, and rightfully so, the latest, the best algorithms, the best models, you know, the latest version of PyTorch, whatever they want to run. And then the production team can't easily incorporate all these into the framework. And then the second limitation is that they're tied to each company's infrastructure, so everyone is building you know, the same thing, solving the same problem, and there's no sharing of effort across them. So at the beginning of this year, we, we looked at this space and we thought, okay, ML platforms are a very important uh, primitive for, for improving machine learning, but we asked, can we provide similar benefits to these systems, but in an open manner, uh, in a manner that's both open source, but also open tooling, and that you can easily combine it with whatever you know, latest and greatest system you want to run uh, without being bottlenecked on the team that builds it. And that's what we did in, in the MLflow project, which we introduced uh, this, uh, uh, this June at Spark Summit uh, in San Francisco. So uh, MLflow is an open source end-to-end -end machine learning platform, uh, and it's also designed to be uh, open in terms of what you can use it with. So MLflow works with any machine learning library, any programming language, because it's based on technologies such as REST APIs and Linux containers that make the system agnostic to what's running inside the models and the code. Um, it's designed to run the same way in many different environments. So you can develop applications on your laptop, you can deploy them on an on-premise cluster, you can also deploy them cross-cloud. So you can use, you know, all these cloud providers are coming out with new hardware, new pricing models, new tools. You can mix and match the best in, uh, of, of all of these. Uh, and of course, MLflow is designed to scale to big data and to interact with, uh, well with Apache Spark. Uh, so we launched the project in June, and it's actually gathered uh, quite a bit of momentum for this early stage. It's still kind of an, an alpha project, so definitely some half edges. Uh, we already have 48 total contributors to the project who've uh, put in code that has gone into releases, uh, and many new features uh, that have come out. So in the talk today, I want to give a brief overview of MLflow and some, uh, some, uh, some new announcements about it. So first of all, how does MLflow work? There are three main components. Um, the first one is the MLflow tracking component. This is an API that lets you record and query experiment runs. So you'll figure out what code went in, into each run of your machine learning project, what data, what configuration, and what results. And this adds structure to the whole development and experimentation process that makes it much faster to iterate through it and to check back to see what went into a result. Second component is MLflow projects. This is a simple format to package up your code into reproducible steps so anyone else can run them later in production and can try new parameters for them. And then finally, we've got MLflow models, which kind of like projects is a, is a packaging format, but for models. So if you package up your model into, uh, you know, into this, uh, this, this format, you can then deploy it to many different deployment tools without having to rewrite or modify it for each tool. So to give you a sense of uh, kind of what, what this means in practice, I'll first go through doing some machine learning without MLflow, sort of so, show some of the problems in a typical process, and then show how MLflow addresses them. Um, so let's say this is a, some simple uh, machine learning code in Python. This is kind of a typical script someone might write for machine learning. So you've got a bunch of, uh, a bunch of algorithms you're calling. In this case, we're, going, we're loading a text file. Uh, then we're doing data preparation. We're splitting it into n-grams uh, of words. Uh, and, uh, and then we train, say, a language model on it to predict the next word based on the previous ones. And of course, we compute some kind of accuracy metrics for it, too. Uh, and then, you know, the typical thing you do today is maybe you'd print those things out. Maybe, you know, you'd put them into a spreadsheet or something uh, to look at what the results were. Maybe you would also save the model to a file using something like Pickle. And as you keep running this program and working on it, you'll soon end up with a terminal window that's filled with stuff like this, where, you know, you ran lots of these experiments, you, you change the parameters, you can see all the things in orange there are, are kind of tunable parameters, and you got different results. But it's very difficult to, to actually work with this in a production setting or in a larger team and, uh, and really efficiently make progress. So, you know, you might go in and say, well, what if I expand the input data? But unfortunately, in the past, you know, we didn't log what data we were using, so we kind of have to rerun everything with, with more data. Uh, you might ask, what if we're tuning some other parameter that wasn't in here? How, uh, how does that affect the previous results? Uh, what if I upgrade my machine learning library? Maybe there was a bug in whatever I used to compute uh, you know, the accuracy or to train the model, and I want to try a new version. 
Um, and as you're asking all these things and changing your code, you quickly begin to lose track of what went into each result and, and, and what it gave you. And especially in a large team, it's really hard to keep track of this. So this slows down development. The problems don't stop here, though. There's also a challenge with deployment. So many organizations, uh, you know, the person uh, doing deployment is different from, let's say, the data scientist that is building the model, and you have to hand over the code and models to another person. And several things can go wrong there, including, you know, maybe they're using the wrong library version and can't run the code. Uh, but then the other challenge you get is you get the, the same bottleneck in terms of the tools the data scientist wants to use versus what you can deploy. So a typical data scientist, you know, will start with one machine learning library, let's say Scikit, and then she will continuously improve the model. Maybe you're getting a better model using Spark. Maybe you're getting a better model using R, using TensorFlow. Maybe you just read some really cool research paper and you want to deploy this into production. And of course, the production engineer has trouble just keeping up with all of these. And you know, once they build one of them, uh, we're on to the next archive paper. So that's definitely a problem. So how does MLflow tackle these problems? So let's start with development. Uh, in development, we're going to take you know, very similar code to what we have before. And then the main thing th that we're going to use to start using MLflow tracking is just change the way we record the results. So MLflow tracking gives you this uh, structured logging API. You can just add log statements. You're still using the same libraries and the same code. And you can record things like your parameters, uh, your metrics, or even models from popular libraries. And in addition to these things, whenever you log things with MLflow, it captures other information like the version of your code in Git, the version of scikit-learn you were using, stuff like that. Um, once you've logged things into MLflow, you actually get a much uh, more powerful way to query the results. So instead of just seeing a giant terminal window with text, you can get this nice UI that you launch to look at the results. And you'll get something like this, where you see all the past runs. You can search through them. You can see everything that went in. And there's also an API for querying them if you want to do it programmatically. So what can you do with the UI? Well, you know, you can search through your runs. You can look at the details of a specific one. You can actually log arbitrary things in them, like, say, an image file, um, and just look at that. And you can even annotate the runs after and say, hey, you know, what was happening in them? So you actually keep track of your work. It's not just this thing you ran a week ago that you vaguely remember working well. Um, and then, of course, this, this interface, this server, is shared with your team. So everyone on your team can look, can compare the results across however they're working with these models. Um, the second thing you can do in addition to inspecting individual runs is comparing them. So you can select a bunch of the runs, uh, click compare, see all the metrics, actually plot different parameters against each other, uh, and quickly improve your model this way. And again, across your team, you can keep track exactly of what code, in, uh, what, what code went in and what results you're getting. Um, then the, beyond, beyond just doing tracking, MLflow also gives you ways to make the code and the model reproducible. So you can package your code into an MLflow project. This is a very simple uh, kind of wrapper around the code that declares its dependencies, like what libraries it depends on, Conda environment, and its configuration. And then the same project can be deployed either locally or in a remote cluster uh, with just one kind of command. Uh, and one of the cool things about this is one person can develop the project and other people the production engineers can just run it and pass in parameters and get the exact same environment and execution without having to know the details of everything that's in there, you know, much like containerizing an application. So that's, uh, that's very powerful for deployment. Um, and then the same thing happens with models. So uh, MLflow's model format is, again, is a very simple packaging format. You can think of it a little bit like a, you know, a container for models that can run arbitrary code. And uh, you can uh, easily log uh, models using uh, many popular libraries, or you can easily use your own if you just provide Python code to do the inference. Uh, and then the, the model format uh, can represent each model in different ways. And then there are a bunch of built-in serving tools. So the same models you log can be deployed to REST serving in the cloud, to batch and stream scoring on Apache Spark, and just the inference code that you can link into your application. And it's, it's the same command everywhere. The consumers of the model don't have to know anything about the libraries and the code that went into it. So using uh, MLflow now, with, uh, uh, if you're going to look at our model deployment, the data scientists always ask the same thing. Can you deploy this MLflow project? And the production engineers have these built-in tools that can deploy it in, uh, in, in common ways. Like, for instance, stand it up in a REST server, put it in Kubernetes, or put it in Apache Spark and run large-scale inference. 
And then the same thing happens if you want to deploy training and data prep to production. You just say, please run this MLflow project, and the engineer can run it the same way, or another data scientist you know, on the other side of the world can run it the same way without worrying about setting it up. So the whole process has become a lot simpler, both for the data scientist and for the engineer in getting their jobs done. So how's the, how's the community been progressing? As I mentioned at the beginning, there have been a lot of features added to MLflow since its release. So we've got uh, a lot of contributions to add model packaging for different open source libraries, storage backends on all the popular clouds, uh, a new Java API in addition to the Python that we launched with, and new examples and many new UI features. Um, and today we just released MLflow 0.7 with uh, improvements in all these dimensions. I want to highlight one major new thing in MLflow 0.7 that I'm really excited about, which is that our studio has uh, joined the MLflow open source community and has contributed a, an R API for MLflow. So this is super exciting for us. Our studio is the source of many really awesome APIs for working with, uh, with R. And uh, now you have a very well-designed R API to use MLflow. And all the downstream users, you know, the, the production engineer that I showed there, can actually deploy these R models without having uh, you know, to know anything about R, they can just use them using the same interface we had before. Uh, so Kevin Kuo from our studio will give a talk on this later today. I definitely encourage you to check it out. It's an awesome talk with some, some great demos. Um, so that's kind of a brief overview of MLflow. To conclude, workflow platforms like MLflow can greatly simplify ML development, and if they're done right, they improve usability for both the data scientists and engineers in the project. And uh, these have been extremely successful you know, in, in sort of the largest companies using data, and we hope that MLflow makes, uh, you know, makes this possible for everyone else as well. If you want to learn about MLflow, there are great tutorials on the website, and we also have three other talks today, the R API, ML factories, and then a two-session long, you know, one-hour deep dive uh, tomorrow with some of the MLflow engineers. Uh, so looking forward to seeing you at those talks, um, and thanks.